This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because, our, because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Thank you. It's good to be back. It's not like I've really left. I've just been here. It's good to be back up here to open God's Word with you. Keep your Bibles open there at uh, 1 John. I reckon as you kind of read through 1 John, you start to work out that the talks aren't going to get any easier. You're like, well, this seems to be ramping up a little bit. Um, And it's supposed to do that, right? It's supposed to kind of challenge you and help you kind of reflect. So let's pray now that God's Word, again, will challenge our hearts uh, so that we might have great confidence that we belong to the Father and know how to live as His children in His name. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank You that You are a good and gracious God, that You have lavished upon us such amazing love that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And so, Father, we pray that tonight you would fill us with great confidence and assurance that we do belong to you and we can be completely confident of that because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, please display his love through our lives. And we pray this in his name. Amen. I don't know if this will come to a surprise to many of you, but uh, I dropped out of preschool after about four weeks. I don't know if that makes me hardcore ghetto gangster or not. Maybe some of you didn't even go to preschool. Uh, But I was the sort of kid when I was growing up at Sunday school, could never remember the memory verse or or the books of the Bible. I think I learnt the books of the Bible uh, through Colin Buchanan when I was about 22, 23, somewhere around there, right? But I know them now. I've got them, right? I've got the tune in my head and everything. Um, and so the you know, uh, Sunday school teachers have to kind of give that sneaky little you know, encouragement, Frodo Frog, so everyone else gets a Frodo Frog for remembering the memory verse and doing the books of the Bible, but Michael, good try. Uh, you, know, you managed to kind of get Luke and then Matthew, not in the right order, but you know, here's a little Frodo and, and off you go. That was kind of my upbringing, that was the kind of kid that I was. And it also meant that uh, in my school education, I wasn't particularly dedicated either. Uh, I went to uh, public schools, and there's nothing kind of, you know, wrong with that, private school, public school, maybe the top 10 HSC schools are public schools. They're selective, right? You know, I didn't go to one of those. Um, but I didn't really make the most of my education. I didn't really learn, I didn't 
really desire, I guess, to read a chapter book until I was in year six and I finally read one then. I think I read my second chapter book with a you know, smaller print in about year 10. And I didn't read any of my set texts for the HSC at all. I read some of the kind of uh, cheat notes about those things. And then my high school visual arts major project, I did the night before it was due. <laughs> it was classy, let me tell you. <laughs> I set it on fire when I got it back. That was uh, a couple of nice little portraits. A uh, little kind of, I couldn't really tell you what it was. I think I made something up in my visual art process diary about the deep meaning of the colours and the, whatever. I don't know what it was. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Uh, but you'll be impressed to know that in my school, uh, I came sixth in the HSC with my, as it was then, TER. Yeah, thank you. That's right. Yeah, I know. I'm kind of, I'm making myself vulnerable. I'm putting myself out there trying to tell you what a hard life that I've had. I came sixth in the HSC. I need to tell you that I didn't get past 50. In fact, my TER was 48.6. And the ducks of our school, I think, maybe got 70. Most of my year, in fact, 50% of my year didn't even register a score. It was 15 and under back then, right? Yeah, it's good. The high school that I went to had um, six-foot-high barbed wire fences around it, uh, either to keep the students in or bad people out, I don't know. Uh, it was kind of wild. We didn't spend a lot of time in the classroom. I've got loads of uh, kind of almost criminal stories I can tell you, which maybe I'll do in a free time tomorrow. You can hit me up for some of those. But at the end of high school, I remember thinking, what are my options? What am I going to do from here? Like, those guys over there, career criminals, that'll be fine for them. This guy over here, you know, he's going to, I don't know, probably eke out his existence in a small dark room playing video games. I don't know. That, that sounds good for him. What am I going to do? I remember thinking, I think what I would like to do with my life is be a greenkeeper. I love the idea of sitting on a lawnmower and just like rolling around the SCG or maybe down the greens of a golf course. Like, how good does that sound? But I also liked drawing and designing things and building things. I thought, architecture. Yeah, I could totally do that. And so I was thinking, maybe I'll do architecture at UNSW. But then I saw it was a six-year kind of degree, and I'm like, I've just done like six years of high school. If I want to do another six in uni, plus you get a debt at the end of it, I don't think so. <laughs> so I chose, and it's very important that you hear this word, I chose to do a trade, right? I, I did a trade as a fire sprinkler fitter, um, if, you, if you want to know what that is, just think of a plumber, except better, right? That's what we are. <laughs> and uh, I, I chose to do that trade, and I remember kind of having that decision, thinking, what will I do with my life? And I remember thinking, I could do anything I wanted to. I, I'd probably bought that lie that the world was my oyster. I'm thinking, you know, greenkeeper, trade, go to uni, maybe be an astronaut at NASA, uh, I don't know, all the different options. No, I think I'm just going to do a trade. The question I guess I have now upon reflection is what was the basis for my confidence that I could go and do anything? You actually have to get a certain point in your TER to get into uni or architecture at UNSW. If I wanted to be an astronaut at NASA, what is it about my education, my upbringing or my dedication to learning that would have actually got me into that? I had absolutely no basis at all to think that I could go do whatever I wanted. If I'm honest, a trade was probably about the best I was going to do, apart from just being unemployed for the rest of my life. Did I choose to do that? Where does my confidence come from? And I guess that's the question I want to ask you. Where does your confidence come from? There's a big question that we're forced to ask tonight, especially, you know, as you think about your relationship with God, what, what is your confidence based on there? Is it about your, your goodness, the, the way that you work hard at being a good citizen? M maybe you're a Christian because your parents are Christian. That's what your confidence is based on. Like Pete said last night, he was a steadman. That's why he was a Christian. Is it based on the influence of your parents? Or maybe it's just kind of based on your natural gifts. Of course, I'm a human. You know, God loves humans. It's his job to forgive. That's why I'm a Christian. That's where I am. You know, maybe really what you've got is loads of self-confidence. Maybe for some of you, you've actually got no confidence in yourself. Even though you are extremely talented, are hardworking, and live a very privileged life. And again, what does that mean for your confidence in your relationship to God the Father, that you belong to Him? Where is your confidence that you truly are His child? Again, maybe the problem is you have no confidence 
that you do belong to Him. And so I want to ask you the question, what is lacking in your confidence? Why, why aren't you more confident that you are a child of the Father, especially after what we heard last night in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1? What, what great love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That is what you are. So why would you be lacking in any confidence? You see, tonight, I want you to be confident that you are children of the Father because of God's love towards you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question we're first going to tackle is how do you know whether or not you belong to the Father or to the world? And so here is our first uh, subordinate point, that's the language we're using. I, I, almost, I keep saying something else, but subordinate point, our first one is belonging to the Father. It's in your outlines, verses 10 to 22 of chapter 3. How do you know you belong to the Father? Well, let me read verses 10 and 11 to you again. This is how we know who the children of God are and who are the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. How do you know that you belong to the Father and not to the world? Well, it's because you love the other believers and you don't hate the other believers. Now, this is something that you might think is kind of common to all people, but it's not. It's unique to Christians because people in the Father's family care for those in the Father's family. Because the world doesn't care for Jesus. The world doesn't care for His people. I mean, why would the world care about the church? Why would He care? Why would the world care about those who believe in the Father? The world doesn't want Christians to tell them that Jesus is the shape of life. Right? That kind of message is abhorrent. It's a hard message for the world to swallow. They're happy living their own vision of what life is, existing in their vision of what life is. No, the church is only useful to the world and only a useful institution if it, I guess, alleviates poverty, uh, maybe helps house refugees or provides some kind of community space where people can have their birthday parties when it's wet or do yoga or something, right? Now, in this way, those people who belong to the world and not to the Father behave like Cain. That's what John says, they behave like Cain. Verse 12... Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. I don't know how you would describe the behavior of Cain here, but I think jealous hatred would be a good way to kind of sum up the way that Cain behaves. And John says, this is what it looks like to belong to the world, to belong to the evil one who rules over the world. It looks like jealous hatred. Now, I think when that same kind of Cain behavior, that jealous hatred kind of invades the church, when we behave like that on the inside of the church, I think jealous hatred often kind of manifests itself, maybe in stinginess towards others. Oh, I don't want to give up too much of my time, certainly not too much of my money, not towards these people. Sometimes I think it even kind of uh, shows itself as resentment towards others, bitterness, and jealousy and envy about the gifts that other people have and what they're able to do, but I, I don't get a chance to do that. I haven't been gifted with that. But then outside the world, you're probably very familiar about what jealous hatred looks like in the world itself. Outside the church, jealous hatred often uh, looks like uh, contempt for the certainty that you have for what life looks like. Yeah, it, it often, uh, it looks like jealous hatred about your confidence of your identity and, and your place and where you belong, especially in a world that doesn't want to believe there is any objective truth, that you can just do you and go your own way. You stand up and say, no, there is a shape to our sexuality. There is a shape to our purpose. There is a shape to what life looks like, and it's not you, it's Jesus. And people are like, oh, that just sounds like bigotry. You can ask Pete what that means afterwards. Um, and so, verse 13, don't be surprised if the world hates you, right? Because you belong to the Father and not to the world. You belong to life, not death. 
you belong to Jesus. Verse 14 and 15, let me read them for you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. That's harsh. That's rough, isn't it? Verse 15, you're a murderer if you do not love other believers. In fact, if you hate the believers, if you hate the church and the people that stand with Jesus, who stand for the gospel, who follow him as the shape of life, you are like a murderer. Now, you just should stop and let that settle in for a second. If that really grates your ears, if you feel like, Ugh, I don't like the sound of that, just sit with it for a second. John is really trying to emphasize a point here for you. What do murderers do? Murderers end life. Murderers are against life. They are for death. Anyone who is against Jesus is against life because Jesus is life. And it means that you are for death. If you hate a brother or sister, it is like you are against life. It is like you are a murderer. But that is not you. That is not us seated here today. Because you know you belong to the Father. You don't belong to the world. You're not like Cain. You're not a murderer. You don't hate your brother and sister. In fact, you love the other believers. That's the shape of your life. Now, there are lots of different ways that we can talk about love. You know, I, I, I love bacon. It's a convenient that I'm wearing this shirt tonight. Um, but I also love my children. And I will sacrifice things for my children that I will not sacrifice for bacon. I hope I've said that the right way around. What I'm trying to say is I love my children more than bacon. In fact, I love them in a very different way. What does love look like in this context where you are to love your brothers and sisters? Well, verses 16 to 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone, if any of you has material possessions and you see a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. What does love look like in this context? Well, firstly, it looks like sacrificial love. It is sacrificial love like Jesus. It is costly love. It will cost you something. You know, people say love is love, all we need is love. It all sounds so flowery and lovely and wonderful, but it will cost you to love someone, especially those who aren't particularly loving back, even those that seem to grate against every fibre of your being. It will cost you to love them. It is sacrificial. Secondly, what does love look like? Well, it looks like action and truth, verse 18. It's not just about paying lip service to, hey, hey brother, I'll pray for you. But I'm not, because I'm going to forget as soon as I walk away. Hey, um, you know what, I, I hear that you're in great need, and that sounds really hard for you. Um, I'll pray for you, I guess. But I'm not going to give you any money, I'm not going to help you out, I'm not going to do anything for you, I'm just going to say it with words. No, love is practical, it comes in action, and it comes in truth. It is not just words or empty talk. You see, this is the kind of love that we are to have for other believers. It is practical and it is costly. That's what love is. And you know you belong to the Father and not to the world because you love the children of the Father, your brothers and sisters, in this sacrificial way. That's how you know you belong to the Father. And that is why so many of you give an offering to church every week. You know, out of your hard-earned cash from the shifts that you're working at Macca's, from the trolleys that you're pushing around at Coles and the shelves that you're stacking and the other things that you're doing, that's why you give generously of your money to church to, to provide for the work of the gospel in that place, to love your brothers and sisters. That's why some of you have even given up your money to help other people in your youth group who couldn't afford to come to LIT. You've said, you know what, I've got this extra money I'll help pay for your ticket. In fact, we've got like 10 of us together. We'll help pay so that you can come to LIT. 
so generous, so costly, so sacrificial. That's why so many of you give up your time to go sit with the person here at LIT who doesn't know anybody. You're like, I see that person over there. No one's really hanging out with them. I'll give up my time to go hang with them. That's why so many of you, when you were choosing your cabins and and working out who was going to sleep where, even though you desperately wanted to be in this cabin with all your friends and the people that you've met before, you saw this person over here and you thought, they would do well in this cabin with this group of people. I'll give up my spot for them. That's why so many of you, when it comes to dinner time, don't just rush to a table to sit with all the friends that you know and the people who know the same jokes and have the same history as you. You walk into a room and you think, who will I sit with tonight? Who can I love and serve and help? That's what you do, isn't it? That's how we love one another, sacrificially, at great cost to ourselves, even though our heart wants us just to look after number one. That's what it looks like to be a leader. And you are a leader in training. That is leadership right there, to love other believers, your brothers and sisters, practically and costly. Because why? Verse 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Your love for other believers is outward looking. That's how love works. And this is also how you continue to train your heart to love like Jesus has loved you. Um, We're going to do a little bit of translation work here in verse 19. Put your hand up if you've got an NIV, could be an 84 or 11, that's okay, it's quite a few of you. You'll have a translation that says, this is how we set our hearts at rest in His presence um, or when our hearts condemn us, if you're using the 84. If you've got an ESV, you'll say, it'll say something like, this is how we reassure our hearts. And if you've got a Holman Christian Standard Bible, we have any Holman people in the room? There's always a couple. Good to see you, brothers. Um, or sisters, I can't quite tell from up here. Um, uh, you'll have something, this is how we reassure our conscience or set our conscience at rest. Um, the actual... If you translate it word for word, that little phrase there, it says very plainly, this is how we persuade our hearts. And and I reckon that translation, if you kind of pull all those three together, is about right. It's not your conscience, it's your heart. It's not setting at rest, it's persuading it. This is how you train and persuade your heart whenever it betrays or condemns you. Um, So, have a look down at verse 20. If your heart condemns you or betrays you because it wants to love you and not others, what do you do? You remember that you are in God's presence. You remember that you have the great love of God and His generosity shown to you first. And that's how you persuade your heart to go, okay, it's not about me. It's about loving other people. I can sit at a different table tonight. It's not going to be the end of the world. Train your hearts. Or verse 21 If your heart does long to love other believers, if your heart does seek to show practical and costly love to them, then in that moment, after all the good training your heart has gone through, you should then enjoy the reassurance that you truly are a child of the Father and you can have absolute confidence in your prayers to the Father because you are confident you are His child. Right? Maybe you can kind of see the circular argument that kind of develops here. Uh, You belong to the Father, so you love other believers. And if you love other believers, that reassures you that you belong to the Father. And because you belong to the Father, you love other believers. And because you love other believers, that reassures you that you belong to the Father. And because you belong to the Father, you're you're working out... This is how this kind of keeps going around. This is what John is doing here. He does this so often in his letter. Pay attention to the things that just keep popping up. In fact, if you've got an NIV, what's the subtitle to the section that begins at chapter 3, verse 11? More on love and hatred. It's like they've just gotten lazy at this point. John's talking about this here, about love for believers. Oh, wait, he's come back to it. It's just kind of more on love and hatred. And we're going to return to this a little bit later, okay? This, these cycle things in John's letter are supposed to make you stop, listen, pay attention, understand. Here's my big question for you. Do you love your brothers and sisters? Do you love other believers in practical and costly ways? in action and in truth, not just in lip service. 
because your practical and sacrificial love for other believers is evidence that you belong to the Father and you can belong to the Father with absolute confidence. Here is our our last subordinate point, belonging with confidence. We'll look at the rest of the passage, chapter 3, verse 23 to 4, verse 6. I love that our memory verse for this week is 3, verse 23. I had no say in that. Who came up with that? Who, Who chose that? Was that like a committee thing? It was. Well done, committee. Or no? Yeah? Excellent. Good, right? Um, because verse 23 and verse 24 are the key verses in this section of uh, John's letter. Right? This is what it says. We keep His commands and do what pleases Him. Verse 23. And this is His command, to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as the command He gave to us. I've changed it a little bit, so it doesn't quite work. Verse 24, the one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them, and this is how we know that he lives in us, we know it by the Spirit he gave us. You see, these verses are the centrepiece of this passage because if you understand the logic of this, then you understand the logic of the passage. The logic is really simple, right? God has given us two things. Firstly, God has given us a command, a command to believe in Jesus and to love one another, the other believers. And secondly, what has God given us? He has given us His Spirit, so that we are able to keep the command that He gave us. He doesn't say, believe in Jesus, love each other, I'll see you guys later. No, believe in Jesus, love one another, and now here is my Spirit, so that your heart might be trained and persuaded and shaped so that you can keep the command, so that you can keep believing Jesus and keep training your heart to love your brothers and sisters in action and in truth. So let me ask you again, do you believe in Jesus, that He is the Christ, that He is the shape of life, that He has come in the flesh, that He has been gazed upon, witnessed, seen, touched, proclaimed? Do you love other believers? with practical and costly, generous, sacrificial love. Yes, do you do those things? Then you can have absolute confidence that you belong to the Father and that you are His child. Because you can't do either of those things without the Spirit of God. You can't believe in Jesus, you can't confess that He is Lord and you can't love other believers without the Spirit of God. Right, even that person at church who is really kind and really patient and attentive to your needs, who takes the time to follow you up, maybe even writes you little encouraging notes, gives you phone calls if people still do that, or sends you a text or, or tags you in on Facebook or whatever they do, even those people, as lovely as they are, if they deny the teaching of the apostles, the teaching of the eyewitnesses, that Jesus is the Christ and the only shape of life, then they don't have the spirit of truth. What they have is the spirit of error. The spirit spirit of falsehood is what what John says. You know, they're the sort of people that say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I like the Gospels, but I don't really read what Paul says because he's a bit of a misogynist, so I'd leave that little bit out. No, 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 you accept all the witness testimonies, not just some of it. Be wary of those people and even their loving affection. Be wary of them. Even the person at church who can quote the Bible chapter and verse, who who know all the great kind of theologians, they know all the the wonderful doctrines out there, they can talk to you about predestination, they know about Herman Herman Bavink and and John Calvin and and whoever else, right? They They can bamboozle you with these great big words. Even that person that maybe you sit in awe of, who knows the Bible so well, if they, even them, don't love other believers practically and sacrificially and generously, they don't have the spirit of truth. They have the spirit of falsehood, the spirit of error. And it's important to know the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Uh, Have a look at chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Dear friends, 
do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world, this is how you can recognise the Spirit of God, that would be the Spirit of Truth. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Test the spirits. Those people that come into our churches who are really anti-Jesus, anti the eyewitnesses, maybe they like some of it but not all of it, they don't look so different from you and I. Sometimes they're the people that have the best social skills and make you feel the best. But if they don't love other believers, if they don't confess Jesus Christ, come in the flesh, that's the spirit of falsehood and you should be wary of them. But you have nothing to fear about them. You have nothing to fear about the spirit of error or falsehood. Why? Because verses 4 to 6 of chapter 4. You, dear, ch- you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. Good for them. It's a great big ghetto echo chamber. But we are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. Why should you listen to them? Because they have seen, heard, touched, gazed upon the Lord Jesus. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. See, you will spot the spirit of error, the spirit of deceit, because you listen to the eyewitness testimony, because you spend time in the Word. You're not tricked or bamboozled. You're not, you don't kind of fall as a sucker for misquotes that kind of pop up on uh, inspirational Instagram feeds, you know? What did Jesus say? I think he said, uh, do unto others before they do it to you. That's right, that's what he said. That sounds like what something Jesus said. Don't fall for that stuff. You know the Word, you believe the Word. And can you see how, again, we're doing another great big cycle? Can you see? Is there a picture on there? There it is, Right? You belong to the Father, and because you belong to the Father, you believe the eyewitnesses. Because you believe the eyewitnesses, you confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Because you do that, you know that you belong to the Father. Here we go again. Because you belong to the Father, you believe the eyewitnesses, you confess Jesus, you belong to the Father. Again, here's another point for us to stop, to gaze, to reflect, to think about what John is emphasising and saying to us again and again. Let me ask you two hard questions. Do you believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ? Do you believe that He came in the flesh? Secondly, do you love your brothers and sisters? Do you love the church of God? Do you love His children? Do you love other believers? If you do, then you absolutely belong to the Father and not to the world. You are anointed by Christ, the anointed one, and you are not anti-Christ. You walk in the light and not in the darkness. You have life and not death. Now, I want to be very clear that loving other believers does not make you a Christian, doesn't make you a child of God. What it does is it gives you confidence that the Spirit of God is at work in you, and that you already are a child of God as we put our trust in the Lord Jesus. Our last big question is the question that we started off with. What is lacking in your confidence that you truly are a child of the Father? Keep confessing Christ. Keep training and persuading your heart, especially when it betrays you and wants you to look after yourself. Keep loving others as the Spirit does His work in you. And do this because we can belong to the Father with absolute confidence. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank You that You do not leave us on our own to wonder whether or not we have salvation. 
to wonder whether or not we truly are your children and if we really do have life or we're just existing and waiting for death. Father, we thank you that you give us the assurance of your love, that we are your children just as Jesus is the Son, that you give us your Spirit so that we might love you and love other believers in the same costly and sacrificial way that the Lord Jesus has loved us. And so, Father, please continue to fill these, my brothers and sisters, with great confidence, every confidence that they belong to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.